working our way through the book, and today we come to uh, chapter 14, and um, it is the, verse 1 will tell you, it is the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth, the dearth. Now, you look at the word dearth, and um, just from an English standpoint, you see the word earth in there, if you remove the D. You look at it again and you remove the R, you see the word death. And it's a picture of death in the earth. And I guess that's a picture of the world. The, there's death in the earth. Everybody dies and things die and, and animals die and they go extinct and all these things happen. There is dearth, and there's a word of the Lord that comes to his prophet concerning the dearth. I mean, do you want some understanding as to what's going on here? I mean, to the world, it's a dilemma. I titled it The, the Dilemma of the Dearth. And, uh, you know, as you go through the chapter, you'll see that the Lord will kind of describe the dearth in verses 1 through 7, and then there will be a discussion, a discourse back and forth between the prophet and the Lord, and then afterwards will be what appears to maybe like a dilemma, but as you look at it, it'll make sense, because we'll have to grab some teachings from other chapters and put them together, and it'll make sense. And it may be a dilemma to those who don't know the Lord, but it's not so much a dilemma to those of us that know the Lord and his word. We need the word of the Lord like that will come to us concerning the dearth. Now, again, I guess, I guess in a, a, a dictionary, and I just showed you death and earth, you can kind of see the word, but in a dictionary they would define it as a famine or a drought or a scarcity of crops because the land is barren, uh, kind of uh, was described, uh, maybe prophesied to the, uh, to the people of Israel because Technically, historically, he's talking to Jews in the land of Israel, and he was saying back in the 11th chapter, you know, I, I care for this land. I'm, I'm watching this land. Uh, verse 14 of the 11th chapter of Deuteronomy, I will give la rain in due season on the land. I'll give the first rain, the latter rain. I'll send the grass. But in verse 16, he warned them, take heed that your heart be not deceived. Uh, Deuteronomy 11, 16, 16, 11 backwards. Take heed uh, that uh, you turn not aside and serve other gods and worship them. Verse 17, because if you do, then the Lord's wrath shall be kindled against you and he'll shut up heaven and there will be no rain and the land won't yield her fruit unless, and you'll perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord uh, gave you. So verse 18, lay up my words in your heart. And, and so we begin to see that God was warning them, if there is a time of dearth, rather than just to look around, you better look within and look back as to what caused this to come about. Now, historically, at the time we're looking at, when he's speaking to Jeremiah, 600 and something B.C., there was a king reigning by the name of uh, Jehoiakim, and he was a wicked king. And God was allowing the dearth at that particular time because of the wickedness of that leader and the wicked leadership and the people were following wicked leadership. And I know in a manner of speaking, we're supposed to follow leadership, but there's a time when we have to exercise common sense and pull back and say, I'm not going to follow this. This is just plain wrong. Well, you're supposed to obey every ordinance of man. No, you're supposed to, not every ordinance, the higher power. Romans 14, uh, the higher power. And, and, or is it 13? I forgot the chapter. It might be 13. And, and the higher power is, well, of course, it's God. And the higher power for our country is the Constitution. That's the higher power. It's been well established. That's the higher powers. I mean, these mandates are not part of the Constitution. They're unconstitutional. These vaccinations and quarantines are unconstitutional. So just but getting back to where we are, God's expecting you to have some common sense. 
in your application. Just because one leader like Jehoiakim is going nuts, you know, well, I got to follow him. He's the king. No, you got to pull away and follow the king of kings. And there's times you have to take a stand and do all you can to stand. And there was a dearth at that time. And with that bad leadership, verse 2, the land of Judah was mourning. The Judah mourneth. And the gates thereof, they're, they're languishing. And, and they're black under the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem is gone up. Their nobles have sent the little ones to the waters. They came to the pits. They found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded. They cover their heads. Jack and Jill went up the hill, you know, w with a pail of water, and they come back empty. There's nothing to it. And, and why, why is this? Well, because this dearth that had happened is because of the, the disobedience of the leadership to God's way. And when this happened, they were mourning. Judah was mourning. And they are mourning over the situation now. The king was mourning, you know, the nobles. They were sending their little ones. And, and they were mourning too over it. But they were mourning. The problem that God was trying to get their attention to is you're mourning over the situation and you're not mourning over your sin. You're mourning over the circumstances, but you're not mourning over the condition in your heart. You're mourning over the trouble that you're facing, but you're not mourning over your transgression. And, and I'm trying to wake you up. The Lord is letting this judgment occur. This is a minor judgment. that It's a minor judgment in God's sight. I'm letting this occur because I'm trying to wake you up with it, preparing you for what would be a worse judgment if you harden yourself in this condition and you don't look around and look within and consider and and he's just there there's no water now now we understand uh you know literally that's what was happening there was a dearth there was death in the earth the earth was dying you you go and the fields are hard and they're cracked and they start to separate with those furrows and you you can't break it up, and, you, and it's all like sand. And if you put a, a seed in there, it's not going to grow because there's no water for the seed physically, historically. But one of the problems that was happening is, uh, uh, go to Amos chapter 8. And verse uh, 11, and the Lord's telling you, if you keep con continue in this condition, verse 11 of Amos chapter 8, a number of books to the right, one of the minor prophets is the book of Amos. He's the th third prophet after Daniel. And in the eighth chapter, verse 11, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I'll send a famine in the land, but not just a famine of bread, nor just a thirst for water and the earth is dying but of hearing the words of the Lord and they'll wander from sea to sea from the north to the east they'll run to and fro they'll seek uh, the word of the Lord they will not be able to find it and then in that day the fair virgins and the young men will faint for, for, for thirst and, and one of the things that was happening is you could still get the word of the Lord Verse 1 in Jeremiah, here it comes to Jeremiah, and I want to give the word of the Lord to you. Right now, there's just a physical famine, but that's nothing compared to a spiritual famine. If you think the death is bad now, wait till I withhold my word. And so I'm sending my word to get you back to my word so that I can now give the blessings physically but you've got to receive the spiritual truth. His hope was that through Jeremiah, the people would wake up sadly we're going to see that very few people listen to Jeremiah. And, and the dearth will not just be physical in the earth. It will be death of souls. There will be a real dearth in the earth and, and souls will be plunged into hell. And that's the greater thing that God's concerned about. And he's trying to wake, he's trying to wake them up. The, the verse 4, the ground is chapped. You're like chapped lips, okay? 
the ground is chapped. Now, now I was just thinking about it spiritually. How did God make Adam? From the ground. The ground is chapped. You know what's the problem with a lot of people? They're, they don't have any of the water or the Word of God. They're dry. They're thirsty. Now, thankfully, we're still at a time where you can find water. You can, you can get a Bible. You can, you can uh, find Bible teachers online. I was listening to one this morning, getting ready. I was listening to Scott Strobel in Lockport. There's a good Bible teacher with a King James Bible. That's the pure water of the word, the King James Bible. And I was listening and getting filled this morning as I'm going about doing some daily duties, getting ready to get here. And it's just nice to hear the word of the Lord. I, I tried to listen to DCX for a little bit but uh, it's, it's polluted water. It's not the pure water of the word. And so it's much better to listen to, to Brother Scott. But they're out there. You can go on YouTube. There's a, an entire site called goodpreaching.com. Good preaching, one word, no G at the end. I don't know why the G's not on there, but preaching.com uh, or .org and whatever it is. And that's nothing but King James preachers pure water of the word you could just listen around the clock to the best guys of James Modlish and Bevins Welder and and uh, David Hoffman and all these guys around there you can be listening to good teaching all day long on something like that the ground doesn't need to be chapped because we're not at a point verse 4 where there's no rain in the earth and when that happens the plowmen are ashamed and they cover their heads the plowmen are the, the leaders that are going ahead, the pastors, uh, the, the governmental leaders, and, and th they're going to be ashamed when there's no truth from God coming. Doesn't need to be the case now. It, it's sad now that our leaders, both in and out of pulpits, don't heed the word of God. And they're not plowing with God's word and over land that God has watered with his word. And it's, it's just a mess. And there is dearth in the earth and in jeremiah's day it was spreading and spreading and spreading and then it got to the point everyone's carried away in judgment and we see it here in this country in the churches of this country spreading and spreading and spreading and it's it's a sad thing that uh the plowmen today are ashamed because the there's no rain from heaven they have our artificial mist made up by translation committees which is a very very sad and uh, I had some, some data here. All these uh, modern Bibles, this is the, the Greek text, uh, the critical apparatuses of Nestle's 25th and 26th edition of the Novum Testamentum Greek, which is a fake Greek text that's been made up. We started, the first one was in 1881. And they read all these fake Greek manuscripts and they say the Greek says this. Yeah, but it's the wrong Greek. You're not even reading off the true Greek manuscript. And by the way, you don't speak Greek anyways. God gave you an English Bible. What are you reading this stuff for? And, and, and the plowmen are ashamed. And it's a mess. And, and I, it's an interesting thing. One of the guys that's been involved in writing this stuff is, uh, what's his name here? I forget. It's, uh, this is his own research. And I forget the name of the guy. I think it's Nestle himself and uh, this is his own research that was taken somebody went through his library and and looked at his own research I can get a copy of this if you want later and these are the manuscripts that they've uh, uncovered the 5,255 manuscripts that have been uncovered by archaeologists there are things called papyrus fragments you know what that is? That's a small copy of the New Testament that was made on papyrus. So they used to copy it on papyrus, a type of paper. Uh, and of the papyrus fragments, there have been 81 that have been found. Of the 81, 75 are from Antioch. Do you remember Acts chapter 11 where they're first called Christians? Those are the good ones. Only six are from Alexandria. And yet these guys use the ones from Alexandria. Alexandria is corrupt. So that's that artificial rain. It's, the real rain is Antioch. It's God's rain, but they don't use it. 
the unseals of the 267 that were found. An unseal is a copy of the New Testament written entirely in capital letters. It was commonly used by Latin and Greek scribes. They call them majuscules. Of the 267 found, 258 are from Antioch. Only nine are from Alexandria, and they use the Alexandrian corrupt ones. Of the cursives, the 2,764 that have been found, a cursive is a copy of the New Testament written in small cursive Greek, you know, like cursive writing. They're called minuscules. Of the 2,764, 2,741 are from Antioch. Only 23 are from Alexandria, and they use the uh, Alexandria, and they ignore the ones God gave. And so they're using artificial rain. And the plowmen are ashamed. And of the lectionaries, which are books that were used in worship services written by the pastors, of the 2,143, all of them are from Antioch. Zero are from Alexandria. Because none of those guys were real preachers or pastors. They were philosophers sitting around with a cup of coffee writing things down. And so 99.3% of all these things totaled up are from Antioch. Only 0.7% of the 5,255 found, only 38 are from Alexandria. 5,217 are from Antioch, and they don't use it. And this is from the library of one of their own people recorded in, reported in an article 1966 by Dr. Uh, w. Edward Glenny of Central Baptist Theological Seminary. He went through the guy's library that does this. These guys willingly, knowingly are bringing forth dearth to God's people. That's what you're hearing on Christian radio and Christian TV. And God's saying, look, I've brought the word. I'm trying to warn you. If you continue, you're going to languish. You're going to mourn. You're going to be, he calls it in verse 2, black under the ground. Black. When people die, you know what they wear? They wear black is the color of mourning. And there's death. And there's not death due to the sword and blood. There's death due to starvation. And people are still walking around in black because people are starving. And, and, the, and that, the dearth. And uh, verse 5, he goes on and he explains. And verse 4, we saw the plowmen are ashamed. They cover their heads. They don't want to talk to you. They can't answer questions. They just run and they hide. And the hinds calve in the field and they forsake the field because there's no grass. A hind is a female deer. In the Bible, they use the term hind, and the other term is heart, H-A-R-T. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, that's the male deer. And both the hind and the heart, they need the water of God, and they're not finding what they need. Uh, the, uh, the sad thing about that is, going back historically, uh, doctrinally, is these uh, animals, what did they do wrong? I mean... They didn't do anything wrong, and our sin brings judgment upon the inferior creatures. What have they done? A hind is a pleasant creature. It's young, it's loving, it cares for its children. And the point is the ripple of our sin of not following God's word falls across onto young, loving things like even children. And, and it just the ripple of the sin that brings death, the, the death in the earth that we're watching today. We're watching spiritual death that's translating into physical death as physical diseases are increasing and genetic diseases and autoimmune diseases and all these things are increasing in our time. We didn't see this stuff 50 years ago. When I was a doctor, there was maybe one autoimmune disease. There weren't that many genetic diseases. Today, they're everywhere, and they're falling. The dearth that's coming upon planet Earth, why? Because we've refused God's Word. God's Word is the source of all life, spiritual and physical. And uh, verse 6, the wild asses are standing in the high places. And now, now the wild ass, go, go to Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11 and uh, verse 12. The wild ass is a picture. I mean, yes, it's, a, it's an animal. We understand that. And they're tough animals and they don't like to obey and they like to do what they want and they're stubborn. But Job 11 verse 12 says, for a vain man, he would, you know, he wants to be wise, but <laughs> man is born like a wild ass is cold. 
And it's a picture of a man in his first birth. He refuses the new birth. He refuses the new heart. He refuses the new mind from God. He wants to stay in the first birth. And he's like a wild ass. And, and the wild asses are standing in the high places. Verse 6 of Jeremiah 14. You know who's running things? People who aren't born again. You know who's running your government? People who aren't born again. You know who's running most churches? People who aren't born again. And, and you know what happens in a lot of those churches? I was on the phone with someone this week uh, who's on the board of a particular church, and I'm, I'm thinking, that board, what happens is they follow the world's ways. And so, oh, there's a successful businessman. You ought to be on our board. Well, there, there's a guy that's made a lot of money. You should be on the board. Well, how do you think they made a lot of money? Nine times out of ten, using worldly techniques and worldly standards and worldly methods, which is of the world. And God doesn't want these people on the boards of his churches, wild asses in the high places, making decisions, deciding which direction the church is going to go in. You know what they look for? They look for, well, I'm trying to build a bigger business. We're trying to build a bigger church. The business techniques work here. Advertising works. When we advertise, we want to find out what the people want. Why don't we find out what the people want? We'll make a bigger church. How about what God wants? God doesn't want what the people want. The people want the wrong thing. One of the reasons there's a dearth is the people wanted the blessings without the blesser. They, they wanted the goods without God. And that doesn't work. And wild asses are in the high place. Uh, verse 6, they snuffed in the wind like dragons. The dragon is the devil. They start getting the scent of the devil in there. And their eyes are going to fail because there's no grass. There's no growth. There's no spiritual growth going on here. And so the first seven verses, we've learned where's this scarcity, this famine, this drought, this barrenness coming from? It's coming because we don't want God's word, which breaks my heart if it were just the world, but it's God's church doesn't want God's word. That guy over here, Nestle and Aylin, with their library and all their fake Greek manuscripts, guess what? The average Christian wants a Bible written off one of those Greek manuscripts rather than God's book. And I like my NIV, and my like, I like my message Bible, and I like my living Bible, and I like that. And God's saying, that's just going to bring mourning and languishing and a spiritual death and the dearth. Now, Verses um, 8 through 12. And, and even the seventh verse, because it's a paragraph marking, I probably I got that wrong. It should be 1 through 6, whatever. Who cares about my divisions? Let's just look at what the Lord says. Here's the prophet now. And the prophet is considering this because verse 1, the, the word came to him. So here's someone sensitive to God's word, wanting to meditate on God's word, one who's considering God's word, one who's looking at the circumstances in his land in the light of God's word. And as he's looking at it, his response is, O Lord, though our iniquities testify against us. I mean, he's recognizing it's, it's our iniquities. And, yeah, we brought this dearth upon ourself. And, but he's saying, he's pleading right here in a prayer, well, do thou it uh, for thy name's sake, for our black backslidings are many. We've sinned against thee. Uh, his prayer probably is, I'm hoping you'll turn things around. Um, you'll, you'll get things back to normal for, for thy name's sake. I mean, you can't really do it for what we've done, for our backslidings are many, and we've sinned against thee. And he's beginning to pray, kind of like Daniel did in Daniel 9. Do you remember in Daniel chapter 9, that's one of the, the next uh, book after 
Jeremiah's Ezekiel and then Daniel and next major book. And uh, Daniel was in a position where now they've been carried off captive. And in the ninth chapter of Daniel, in verse 2, in the first year of the reign uh, of his reign, that would be Darius's reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. And he was reading Jeremiah's book, which was a smart thing to do. And then as he's reading the book, he's beginning to realize, I mean, look, I understand from Daniel's standpoint, he's a young kid, he's what, 12, 13, 14 years old. All of a sudden, his mom and dad are killed. All of a sudden, an army carries him away captive to a strange land. He hasn't seen the temple in a long time. He's been living in this strange land, and he's trying to understand, and he's reading the book to get understanding. That's the only way you'll get understanding is God's book. But as he's reading it, verse 3, I set my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes, and I prayed to the Lord my God. I made my confession. I said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, the one that keeps covenant and mercy to them that love him and that keep his commandments, verse 5, we have sinned. And right away, just like Jeremiah was doing, our iniquities testify against us. Notice what Jeremiah did. He didn't say they've sinned. He didn't say their iniquities are testifying. He threw himself right in the lot with the people. I mean, I, I pray like that. I can't tell you how many times a day about the church. Oh, Lord, after listening to Christian television or radio, oh, God, we've sinned. We have sinned in throwing out your word. We have sinned in wanting these fake Bibles rather than wanting your word. And, and I, I'm, hey, I'm part of the church. And the church is sick. And she's brought her own illness upon her. Now, now I, I don't want to be harsh or anything. Um, you know, I was a doctor. And uh, I was a very different kind of a doctor. One uh, very intelligent uh, Jewish lady said, man, you really march to the beat of a different drummer. And yes, I don't follow policy and procedure manuals. I don't follow the rules coming down from the CDC. I always tried to practice medicine like an art and a science. And I wanted to learn, you know, God, how did you make this body? And, and how did you make it in a way that perhaps you can keep it healthy? Now, I'm wise enough to know that sin is a reality, and I'm wise enough to know that no matter how well I try and take care of myself through good nutrition, good rest, and good exercise, I'm going to get old and get disease. Why? Because God has made it that all bodies are corruptible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I don't care who you are. If you're Jack LaLanne, you're going to get old and die. Even Jack LaLanne had his physical problems. It just real, you've got to be a realist. I understood this. But with the church, it might not have to be this way because the church is a new creature with a new temple and a new body spiritually. It's soul and it's spirit. Yes, its buildings will get old. Yes, its bodies will get old. But its souls and its spirits should be refreshed and full of the spirit of God and full of life and full of the fruit of the spirit. And if the church isn't, guess whose fault it is? It isn't God said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put corruptible genes in my church. No matter how they obey, they're still going to get sick and old and die. He didn't do that with his new birth. He did that with old bodies but not with the new birth. And so when I see this in the church, I, oh, God, we have done this. Our iniquities, our transgressions, so we've done it. We can't look around anywhere. We've got to look at the mirror. And the church has done this to itself, and that's how he prays, oh, Lord, <laughs> just like Daniel was, our iniquities testify against us. So what are we going to do? Maybe you need to trash this thing. But then he pulls back and he realizes in verse 7, but you've got to fix it for thy name's sake because your church has the name of Jesus Christ on it and not another Christ and not another Jesus, but the real one. 
And so he's, he's got a, a, a plea for the God to move on behalf of his own namesake and his own glory because our backslidings are many. We've sinned against thee. You didn't sin against us. You didn't do anything wrong, God. Any problems we have are ours. Are you watching me out there in Christian TV land? You dumb charismatics that think God isn't doing what he deserves for you. He's not doing to you what you deserve. Are you still living in America, you charismatics? He ought to shove you in Somalia with the pirates. And he, and he may one day. Our backslidings are many. You live in America and you complain as a Christian. You better be on your face repenting. Okay. Verse 8. And the prophet praying to the Lord. Oh, the hope of Israel. The Savior thereof in the time of trouble. Why shouldst thou be as a stranger in the land, as a wayfaring man that turneth aside to tarry for a night. Uh, why should thou be as a man, a stone-eyed, as a mighty man that cannot save? I mean, the way it looks to the world and even to a lot of Christians is God just can't do his job. Like a mighty man astonished, just overcome in a battle. Like, like, like Goliath uh, going in to a battle with a three-foot guy and losing. Uh, what? I should have won this battle. What's the matter, God? You can't take care of these little problems? But it's not God. It's you. You're the ones with the iniquity. You're the one that let the little foxes and the little problems build up and build up and build up to this point. It's not God that's the problem. And, and then and the sad thing is these verses are so prophetic in terms of the fact that the hope of Israel is the Savior. The hope of Israel is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And he did come one day in a time of trouble when they were under the burden of the Roman yoke. They couldn't even have a king. They had Herod sitting on the throne an Edomian rather than a Judean from Judah. And a time of trouble, and he was like a stranger and a wayfaring man in the land. He came unto his own, his own received him not. He was in the world, and the world knew him not. What's wrong with this picture? You say, well, that was just history. Yeah, what's wrong with this picture? Excuse me, folks. See this book, this King James Bible? This is the Word of God in English. It's pure. This is as a stranger and a wayfaring man in the church. And it shouldn't be that way. People should be giving reverence and bowing down to that thing. Oh, the Word of God has come. And the Word of God has no place today in God's church. None. Talk to Christians. You're lucky if you can find one in a thousand that want to know what the pure Word of God is. It, it, it's, it's the dearth, folks, the dearth. Christian, I'm looking right at you. All the problems you have, the dearth that you go through. Well, I don't have the love. I don't have the joy. I don't have the peace and the long-suffering because you don't have the book and you won't ref and you refuse it. And it's as a stranger and a wayfaring book in your land. You want no part of it. Why should God look as an astonished mighty man that cannot save? And, and the amazing thing, verse 9, he says at the end, Yet thou, you, O Lord, you are in the midst of us. And, and we are called by thy name. We still call ourselves Christians. And the reality is the Spirit of the Lord is right there, ready to work in a moment's notice and to guide you into truth, if you'd let him. But no, I don't want the Spirit to, to guide me into truth. I want to pray like, like the jerks on Christian radio. Oh, Lord, I'm yours today. Do with me what you want. How about read my book, God says. Would you like to, oh, no, 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 I don't want to do that. But when I get in my car and I drive to Tim Hortons, you find me a good parking place and make sure I get that last jelly-filled donut I've been waiting for. You know, uh, you, you don't think that goes on in these rotten Christians' hearts and minds? And, and the spiritual dearth they have, 
They want God to be their genie rather than to be their source of wisdom and to be their guide and to be their Lord. That's the saddest thing. They want a Savior. They don't want a Lord. Save me. Do something for me, but don't tell me what to do. And don't tell me to clean up and change my life. Why shouldst thou be as a man of stone-eyed, as a mighty man that cannot save? There was a situation that was going on like that back in the book of Numbers. Uh, Numbers is a great book. Uh, Numbers chapter 14. And Numbers is, is a history book of the history of the nation of Israel when they were in the wilderness. Which, by the way, I was, I was talking to my wife either yesterday or this morning, I can't remember, and some teacher was talking about the promised land and uh, trying to give the impression that the promised land is the perfect will of God today. And actually, that's not it. The, the promised land is the millennium. And you were once in sin in Egypt. You've got to get your types right or, or it'll mess you up. You were once in the burden and the bondage of sin in Egypt and God delivered you from Egypt and he's put you on the wilderness wandering, which is 40 years. And most of you, that's about all you're going to be saved is 40 years from the time you get saved till you die. I know there's a few of you that are ex exceptions. You get saved as little children. But the majority of us, you know, we get saved at 20, 30 years old and we die at 70. We've had our 40 years wilderness wandering right here in the wilderness of planet Earth. And that's the wilderness wandering. And the promised land will be when Jesus himself, the real Joshua, takes you into the millennium. But during the wilderness wandering, you can be in the perfect will of God. Moses was. Aaron was. Joshua was. There were people that were obedient. And then there was the mixed multitude and the backsliders and the complainers. You can be one of them too. And in Numbers chapter 14, um, what was happening was there, there was uh, the people were murmuring. What else is new? Verse 1, the congregation lifted up their voice and they cried and they wept and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against the Lord. And they're just complaining, would we have just died in the land of Egypt? Those were the good old days. I mean, what the heck? What are we doing here going to church every Sunday and every Wednesday? Why are we reading our Bible every day? What are we trying to witness to the Lord for? This is tough. We're in the wilderness fighting the world. Why could just back in the good old days, we sat around the flesh plots and we ate with them and we sang their songs and those, that was the easy days for us. So you think. And they're complaining against the Lord. And the Lord was getting so angry at one point. He said in verse 12, I'm going to smite them with pestilence and I'm going to disinherit them and I'm going to make Moses of you a greater nation and mightier. And then Moses said, well, you know, the, the problem is if you do that, Lord, verse 14, they'll tell it to the inhabitants of the land and they'll say, uh, we've heard the Lord are among his people and the Lord seen face to face Verse 15, now if you kill the people, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak and say, you know, the Lord was not able to, to save these people. And you're going to look bad, Lord. And one of the reasons that even backslidden Christians are going to get through this mess is God's not going to let his name get dragged through the mud. He's going to fix this thing to which all glory goes to God because he's going to keep his end of the bargain. He's going to keep his end of the covenant. It's us that are making a mess of things. Back to where we are in Jeremiah. Why should you look as a, someone that can't save? Verse 9. You shouldn't look as someone that can't save. And God's saying, I'm not going to look like someone that can't save. But they might not see it during the wilderness wanderings, but when we get to the promised land and I put the rest of those guys right there and I don't let them enter in and I show it to the whole universe, they're all going to say, wow, what a great God, what an awesome God that he saved. Those wretches that turned against him for 38 years or 39 years in the wilderness. And he still brought them through. What a mighty God. And, and here's the great thing. Salvation is a great thing. It's God's great work. And God's going to complete it. 
And it'd be nice if you'd make him your Lord today, but, but he's going to get you through. You're going to be embarrassed, but he's going to get you through. And, and so, verse 9, why should you be seen as a man astonished, as a mighty man that cannot save? You are in the midst. We are called by thy name. Last three words, leave us not. And he's not going to, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Although your behavior has been abhorrent, I, I, I'm, you came to me at a point where you needed me and I put my new birth inside of you and I'm not going to take it from you. Yes, once saved, always saved. No matter how bad your behavior is, I'll get it worked out. I'll fix it in the millennium. I apparently can't get it fixed with you right now. Thank goodness, salvation's great. Again, I asked the pastor. I was listening to a repeat of it yesterday. Uh, while my daughter, who once professed salvation, is uh, got a boyfriend and she's sleeping with him, is she going to lose her salvation? To which the whole panel agreed, yes. If you sin willfully, you're going to lose your salvation. You can sleep with that guy and 40 other guys and you won't lose your salvation. How do I know? Did you read Solomon's testimony? He slept with a thousand women and he saved in the book of Psalms. I can't remember if it's 71 or 72. Mark, maybe you'll remember. One of those Psalms is a Psalm for Solomon guaranteed his salvation. Yeah. So, so that's, it's God that won't leave us. Nonetheless, in the midst of the discourse, God says in verse 10, Thus saith the Lord unto this people. They've loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquities. He will visit their sins. Then said the Lord, Pray not for this people for their good. Now, this is a major change here, and it's all on one word. Do you know what the word is? This. He didn't say my people. He said, this people. Now here is a big difference. And the Lord knows the difference. The Lord knoweth them that are His. Sometimes even them that are His don't know they're His. I hope you do remember a testimony of one time where you got saved. And if that's all I remember, amen. But there's a lot of things running around calling themselves the Lord people that aren't. And they're not my people, they're this people. Go back to chapter 11. Chapter 11. And what he was warning them is verse 8. They obeyed not, nor inclined their ear, but they walked everyone in the imagination of their evil heart. Verse 9, the Lord said there's a conspiracy found among the men of Judah. And that's another spirit. Inspiration is from God. Conspiration is from the devil. And this is allowing the devil to come in and to write things and to what happens. This is a spiritual root coming from the bottom. And verse 10, they're turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers which refused to hear my words and they went after other gods to serve them. End of verse 10, and have broken my covenant now as they brought these things in it went from generation to generation and they were no longer his people they were another people just had his name on it it like like getting a a can of a soup it says Campbell's soup on it and you open it up and it's not soup it's beans it's something else what how'd that label get on there well, we found this is a good label. Everybody likes this particular label, so we just put it on all these cans. Yeah, but there's, there's no new birth in there. Go, go to Jeremiah 3, verse 8. And God says, When I saw, and for all the causes whereby they backslid and committed adultery, I put her away, gave her a bill of divorce. I'm divorced from her. The covenant's over. Okay? Now, now, maybe there was a grandfather that knew me, but as he began to give place to the devil and follow other teachings, 
and then follow other writings and then go after other gods and maybe start praying to St. Francis of Assisi or praying to Mary or praying to something else. I don't care if it's got the name Christian on it. I'm divorced from that thing. I've got no relationship to that thing. Back to Jeremiah 14. And this people, they've loved to wander. Uh, verse 11, then the Lord said, pray not for them for their good. I can't bless that. It's not the covenant. I'm a covenant keeping and a covenant blessing God. And when you f set up false covenants and other gospels and other spirits and other teachings, I don't care if my name's on it. I'm not part of it. And I can't bless it. And I won't bless it. Now, you say, this doesn't seem fair. Back to verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah. The leaders have responsibility. Fathers, you have responsibility in your family. You wander from your responsibility. Don't be surprised if your kids and grandkids end up in the devil's hell. Leadership is important. And leadership has to receive the word of the Lord. And, and a leader that receives the word of the Lord properly ends up like verse 7, O Lord, our iniquities... A good father that's read God's word has to look and say, God, I've made mistakes in my life. I've done some things wrong. I need help. I need thee. I need, I need, end of verse 9, leave me not. Or I won't be thy people, I'll be another group. This people, that people, but not thy people. Does it make sense? And God says, uh, uh, those, they're not mine. Verse 12, they fast. I'm not going to hear their cry. They can offer burnt offerings and oblations, and they can come with all kinds of money and gifts, and I don't ac accept worship and sacrifice and prayer and fasting of another covenant with a wrong heart. It's got to be my covenant with a new heart. Or I don't hear it. I don't care how well you do it. You have stained glass windows and beautiful ornate buildings. I don't care, God says. You're better off sitting on tree stumps out in the wilderness with my book and doing it my way. I will not accept them, verse 12. I will consume them by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. Now the dilemma. The chapter closes with the dilemma. We've had the dearth. We've had the discourse. Now the dilemma. Then I said, okay, our Lord, God, behold. Now the prophet, that's the problem I'm seeing right now, Lord, is the prophets are telling them, you'll not see the sword. Neither shall ye have famine. I'll give you an assured peace in this place. Don't you worry about it. You're not going to hell. You're going to purgatory. You don't have to worry. You can do what you want. You just come here once in a while, eat a wafer, you'll be fine. It doesn't matter what Bible you read, just read the one that you like the best. No, those are false prophets. And the problem, Lord, we're running into is there seems to be a lot more of the false prophets than the real one. This is the dilemma that's going on. Why does God allow this? Because he's trying you. He's proving your heart. He has a, a living spirit that wants to guide you into truth and you have to literally slap it in the face and say, no, I don't want it. My heart wants this instead. Verse uh, 14, the Lord said, look at uh, these prophets. They prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them. Neither have I commanded them yet, and neither have I spoken unto them. But they prophesy unto you a false vision and divination and a thing of naught and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that prophesy in my name, and I sent them not. Yet they say, O sword and famine shall not be in the land. By sword and famine shall those prophets be consumed." Now, now, not only in, in not only afterlife, but one of the great lies for the last hundred years has been the 
prosperity and the health and wealth gospel of charismatics and you're not really sick, you only believe you're sick, and God came to heal you, and the Bible's a book of miracles. No, it isn't. I heard some idiot today say this for two seconds on, on Christian radio. No, it isn't. The Bible is a book about the Lord Jesus Christ. In the volume of the book, it's written about Jesus Christ, not about miracles. Okay? It, it's about the blesser and the possessor, not the possessions and the blessings and the things you can have. And, and these guys that preach, you know, you don't have to be sick. Send the money my way. I'll send a healing cloth to you and some holy water that you can drink and everything will be fine for you, okay? Do you know what happens? They get cancer in their family, these evangelists. They have people die in their family. God says, I'll send it right to them. And that, uh, that better wake some of you up. And it doesn't. <laughs> you go right on believing these idiots. Yeah, uh, verse 16, and not only that, not only will, end of verse 15, will I, I consume those prophets, verse 16, and the people to whom they prophesy will also be cast out in the streets of Jerusalem because of famine and the sword. They'll have none to bury them and their wives, nor their sons, nor their daughters, for I'll pour their wickedness upon them. Uh, Matthew 15, verse 14. Matthew 15, verse 14. Jesus said it real fine. John repeats it practically every show on what is truth. Let them alone. They're the blind leaders of the blind. If the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. You want to listen to false prophets? You want to follow a false gospel? You want to, want to follow another spirit? You want to read another Bible? You want, you want to enter in all the problems and I don't know what spiritual or physical problems the Lord will bring upon you but there's a point now now if you're saved thank goodness all it's going to do is affect you physically but if you're lost it's going to affect you physically and spiritually and you know one of the worst things that can happen to a person who is following the wrong way one of the worst things that can happen is if somehow they do become successful or prosperous or healthy. And then they live under the delusion while well, everything's going fine and they have no idea of the barrenness and the dearth inside their heart and soul. So thank goodness God does bring judgment to try and wake people up and he brings a dearth every so often into every life as a chance to stir them around and awake them to righteousness. Uh, judgment is according to light. God expects his children to know the truth. Now, with his own children, God is not going to accept any excuse of ignorance from his children. Go to Hosea chapter 4. After Daniel, the book of Hosea, chapter 4. Verses 1 and 6. Hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Israel. Today it's hear the word of the Lord, ye children of Jesus Christ. The Lord hath a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Today his controversy is his inhabitants of the church. That was the holy land. This is the holy place of worship. Why? Because there's no truth, nor mercy, nor knowledge of God in the land. There's very little truth, King James Bible, nor mercy, there's a lot of backbiting and fighting and arguing and debating in the church. Nor knowledge of God in the land. Yeah, you can lose your salvation. What, pastor, how, what God saved you? You don't know your own God? Verse 6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Why? Because thou hast rejected knowledge. I'm not going to accept that excuse from you. I expect better of you. You're my child. There ought to be a desire in you for the sincere milk of the word. And if not, you've coated your heart with corruption and hardened it against my word, although you're still saved. But you're going to have these problems. Believers are expected to leave 
bad doctrine. Go to Acts chapter 17. God has put a responsibility in there. Acts chapter 17. When a preacher stands up before you and teaches you, this is what you're supposed to do as a believer. Acts is the historical example of the New Testament church back when it was pure and it was beginning in a right manner before it had been corrupted by the world. Uh, verse uh, 10, uh, the brethren immediately uh, sent Paul and Silas by night to Berea, okay, who coming thither they went and they went into the synagogue of the Jews and immediately, you know, Paul started preaching. Verse 11, what about those men in that synagogue? They were there supposedly for worship service. They were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Why? They received the word with all readiness of mind. They turned off their cell phones in Berea. And they got bad reception there anyway, so it was only two bars. So, but, but anyways, um, so that's how they turned them off. But they received the word with all readiness of mind and they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. God expects his children to check out a teacher from his book. That's how you determine whether you're going to listen to the guy or not. That's what I do. And the guys I listen to are people that I know are on their knees learning from that book. And the ones that don't, well, they're, they're like a comedy show to me. I get a good laugh for a few minutes, I turn them off. But I certainly don't follow them. Romans chapter 16. God's not going to accept ignorance from his children. If you're a believer and you're in the pew, your job is to listen. And if the doctrine is bad, your job is to leave. You can leave a church for bad doctrine. Not for other reasons. Not because you don't agree with the color on the wall. I don't like the color on the wall either, but who cares? I may not like the color of the carpet. Who cares? The pews may be uncomfortable. Who cares? There's good doctrine here. This is God's word. That's what the decision is made on. The coffee's not good. Who cares? The book is good. Romans 16 Verse 17 through 19, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine you've learned. I mean, you're, you're sitting there, you're reading your Bible, you're hearing a teaching up there, you're marking in the Bible going, that's not in the Bible here, that's contrary to what that says. I got to avoid that. I can't go back there. Why? Verse 18, they're not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, they're serving their own belly. They're building a big congregation. In the old days, it was A, B, C, okay? It was always the Bible and Christ. Today, it's attendance, buildings, and contributions. That's the A, B, C of today. How many people, how many people are you running? How many people came in? There weren't more people than it wasn't a good service. Hey, if they were getting filled, it was a good service. The, the attendance may not be growing, but they're growing in grace and knowledge. It's a good service. Okay, yeah, they learned about the Bible in Christ today. The attendance may not be great. The building may not be great. The contributions may not be great. But if they're learning the Bible in Christ, that's a good work. We can do it around the kitchen in East Aurora, and that's a good work. Verse 19, your obedience should come abroad unto all men. That's what I expect of those in the pews. What about the teachers? Well, the teachers are to stand up and oppose bad doctrine. Go to Colossians 4, verse 17. Verse 16, he said, you know, make sure the epistles read among everybody. I just wrote this letter. God gave it to me to give to you. You need to read it to bless the people. And verse 16, and also read it in the church of Laodicea. Any epistle that I give, even though it may be directed to one church, another church can read it. A church epistle is good for all churches. Verse 17, and, and by the way, say to Archippus, or, or however you want to pronounce his name, uh, take heed to the ministry which you've received in the Lord. Fulfill it. 
I mean, if you're going to be a, a leader, your job is to search out good doctrine. You're to read the right epistles that were written by Paul and by uh, Peter and uh, John and James and Moses. You read those things, you fulfill the calling you have. Go to Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28. That's what leaders are supposed to do. Stand up to bad doctrine. And Brother Mike, you call a lot of things out. Yeah, if it's bad, I'm trying to warn you to stay away from it. It's not healthy for you. Didn't your mom tell you not to eat certain things and not to drink certain things and go to certain places? She did that because she was concerned for your health. Uh, Acts 18, 24, there was a certain Jew named Apollos. He was born at Alexandria. Uh-oh. He was eloquent man. He was a mighty in the Scriptures. That's the Old Testament Scriptures. He came to Ephesus. He was instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. He, he spake and he taught diligently the things of the Lord, but he only knew the baptism of John. All he knew was the, uh, the water baptism. He didn't know about spiritual baptism. So it was a, an incomplete doctrine. Verse 26, six, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla, they heard, they took him to them. And come here, we want to talk to you. And they expounded to him the way of God more perfectly. And then, verse 28, he mightily convinced the Jews publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. There's a better baptism than water. There's a baptism of the Spirit by Jesus Christ. And what did, they, what did Aquila and Priscilla do? Well, we saw an incomplete doctrine. Let's fill it in. Our, this is our job. Okay? We can't allow bad doctrine to go on. We've got to stop it. Dead in its tracks. 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, uh, verse 21. I'm sorry we're going over, but we're going to finish this chapter. I'm not going to accept ignorance, God says, from my children. When I gave you the new birth, I gave you the mind of my son, and I equipped you with the Spirit who would guide you into truth. And you don't need a man to teach you bad things. My spirit will turn you to the right things. And yes, I'll find good men to teach you, and my spirit will approve those men. And if you walk away from them, it's your spirit or another spirit, not mine. You don't leave a church like Scott Strobel's. You don't leave a church where good doctrine and the right word is being taught. There's no excuse for it. I, I, somebody is saying, have you ever looked at that? The, the, the draperies in that place are, are 30 years old. Who cares? The Bible is God's and the teacher's on his knees teaching God's word when he's up there, but he's been praying and preparing. Verse 21, prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. And the dilemma falls right back in the laps of the God's children. You've got a, a dilemma is where you've got to make one of two choices. I'm facing two ways. I've got the straight and the narrow way here or the broad way that seems comfortable over here. Well, the straight and narrow way is going to be a little difficult, but it's okay. God's going to help me, and he's going to get me through it. He's going to bring me to the other side. And so... Verse 17 of Jeremiah 14, Therefore say this word to them, Let mine eyes run down with tears day and night, and let them not cease. For the virgin daughter of my people is broken with a great breach and a very grievous blow. And because they're going in the wrong direction, when I go forth into the field, behold, there's people slain with the sword. When I enter into the city, behold, them that are sick with famine. Yea, both the prophet and the priest are going about into a land they know not. Hast thou utterly rejected Judah? Why hast thy soul loathed Zion? Why hast thou smitten us and there's no healing for us? We looked for peace. There's no good uh, for the time of healing. Behold trouble. We acknowledge O Lord. It's our wickedness. It's the iniquity of our fathers. We've sinned against thee. Do not abhor us for thy name's sake. Do not disgrace the throne of thy glory. Remember break not thy covenant with us. Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? 
Are there any among the translation committees that can give us a Bible? No. Can the heavens give showers? Are not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. You made the dearth as a way to awaken us. Let it awaken us and come back to thee. And let us return unto the Lord. Amen. Uh, hast thou utterly rejected Judah? He asked in verse 19. It, it may seem that way, but the Apostle Paul, uh, looking at it, uh, wrote in Romans 11, I say then, has God cast away his people? God forbid. I'm an Israelite. I'm of the seed of Abraham. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people. Yeah. And, uh, and all we need to do is just acknowledge our iniquities and turn back to him. Christian, if you're someone that, that will not look into God's word and search this issue out, I beg you, this is the most important issue after your salvation is which Bible you read. God has been faithful to give you one. You need not have a spiritual dearth. You, you, the Word of God is plentiful, pure, inspired, preserved, and perfect, and you can have it. There need be no dearth. Lord, we do thank you. And we thank you these minor judgments are nothing compared to the shame of those whose souls are lost and the shame of those at the judgment seat of Christ who will find that all their works are chapped and burned up at the judgment seat. Please, Lord, we just thank you for keeping thy covenant and thy word. In Jesus' name, amen.